The scripture text we're focusing on is from Luke chapter 7, beginning at the 18th verse. The disciples of John reported all these things to him. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind he bestowed sight, and he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Here it's the text, Luke chapter 7, verses 18 through 23. This is the gospel of the Lord. Amen. Will you join me in a word of prayer? O Lord, open thou our hearts to hear through thy word to us draw near. Let us thy word ere pure retain. Let us thy children and heirs remain. Amen. It was the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that It all depends on who you're expecting, right? I mean, in the poem, it was set because the poem is expecting one person. But in our gospel lesson from Luke chapter 7, John the Baptist is expecting somebody else, right? And yet both Clark Clement Moore, who wrote that poem, and John the Baptist are expecting the wrong thing for Christmas. Well, at least John the Baptist is expecting the right person, right? Well, in Luke chapter 7, he's not so sure. So Jesus has to reassure him, has to share words from the prophets that show that he is the one who is to come. And then he says to John, blessed is the one who is not offended on account of me. Earlier today, at our 11 o'clock service, the children shared their Christmas program for us from the Sunday school. And it started off with that poem, or at least just those first couple lines, and it quickly switched into the Christmas story. But in my childhood, any given year, it could have been on Christmas Eve, there were always creatures stirring in the house. Sometimes they were, most often they were mice. And because we had mice that lived in the basement, at least they would get in. We tried to stop them. We had a finished basement, is where we spent a lot of our holidays, but you'd occasionally see them out scurrying across the floor. Or, more often than not, you wouldn't see them because they would be in the ceiling, above the drop ceiling, below the, the, second, the first floor ceiling. And they liked to be on top of the tiles. And so there were very thin foam tiles, and you could hear them up there. It sounded like when they would run from one to the other, like a ball was rolling over your head from one end of the basement to the other end. And so we always had traps out in our basement to catch the mice. And it was always something I enjoyed doing when I was young, was setting those traps, putting that, that little bit of peanut butter on the bait bar in order to catch the mice. And I was always so fascinated by the traps. I like to take a pencil and just reach in and touch that bait bar and see how much it would be and watch it snap. When Jesus, in this lesson for today, said to John the Baptist, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. And Jesus uses a word picture. The word that he uses for offended is the word from which we get our word scandalous. And in Greek, it sounds a lot like that, scandalizo. But what it actually refers to is the action of that, that tr trigger portion of a trap to catch small animals or, or a snare that catches small birds. So when Jesus says to John the Baptist, blessed is the one who is not offended by me, he's saying to them, blessed is the one who is not caught in the trap of expecting somebody else for Christmas. You see, John had sent his disciples to Jesus to ask him, 
Verse 18, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect another? Because John had been speaking in word pictures too. And Jesus, as the coming Christ, was not showing himself to be like any of the word pictures that Jesus that John had presented. John had presented the word pictures that when the Christ came, he would be like an axe at the root of the trees. He would be like chaff burning in a quenchable fire. And he would be the one who would bring swift and severe judgment to the wicked people of the world. And so clear distinction between the good people and the evil people, where the good would be exalted and the evil would be put down forever. Except that when the Christ came, if Jesus was the one, Jesus came doing things that looked a lot more like kindness than judgment. He, he came doing a lot more acts of mercy than he did separating between the good and the evil. Well, and that's what's even more noticeable is how indiscriminate his acts of mercy were. Uh, he was showing acts of mercy to the Israelites and to the Samaritans and to the foreigners. Well, earlier in this very chapter, Luke chapter 7, Jesus even healed the servant of a Roman centurion. They're the occupying army. Surely they cannot be the good guys. And yet Jesus says in Luke chapter 7, verse 9, to that centurion, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. To a Roman centurion. And meanwhile, here's John. The one who has been faithful since birth, even before his birth in his mother's womb. And John is languishing in Herod's prison. Not a good place to be, but the Christ seemingly isn't doing anything about it. Oh, it's almost scandalous. No, it is scandalous. It, it's, it's offensive even. It's enough to make one doubt whether he really is the one who is to come. And so John sends his disciples to ask, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect another? John and his disciples are flirting with the trigger of this trap of being offended by Jesus. When you have a trap, it's designed so that whatever is going to be trapped is expecting something different than what is actually there. So the mouse expects he's going to get a nice tasty treat of peanut butter and then <laughs> trap. Right. Or the bird expects to get some good bird seed and then trap, right? But the disciple of John expects they're going to get revenge. Or vengeance is going to come on those who have been evil and done the wrong things in this world and then trap. But because the scripture says there is no one who does good, not even one. Psalm 14, verse 3. Psalm 53, verse 3. Or in the New Testament, reiterated by Paul, Romans chapter 3, verse 12. That same verse, there is no one who does good, not even one. And so if the Christ is coming to enact swift and severe judgment, make distinction between the good and the evil, then all people are going to be caught in this trap. Caught in the trap because our deeds are not good enough. Although we might look at each other and say, well, I, I think I'm a pretty good person. Do you think I'm a pretty good person? Wait, you're a pretty good person, right? So that God doesn't compare us to one another. He compares us instead to himself. And so believe me, no, no believe him. Not one of us measures up. And so this trap of being offended by Jesus is a trap that catches us in death. Now that was the trap that John and his followers were flirting with. The trap of doubting that Jesus is who he said he was because he was bringing mercy and not judgment. But there's other kinds of traps that cause us to be offended by Jesus as well and expect something else out of Jesus than what he actually brings, especially in our day and age. One of those traps has to do with the scandal of particularity is what it's sometimes called. The idea that Jesus is the only way to the Father because people in our day like to think there are, there are lots of ways that people could build a relationship to God and develop a spiritual relationship that would lead them to the Father. But then Jesus says, John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And people are offended by that. Trap. Or 
There's a lot of people in our day who like to think of Jesus as being universally affirming and tolerant of their life choices. Except that Jesus in John chapter 8 verse 44 calls some people children of the devil because of their life choices. And in Matthew chapter 23 verse 27, he says some people and their choices are hypocritical and are whitewashed tombs. And people hear Jesus talk like that and they can't believe the language and they're offended by it and trap. Or, or some people like to keep Jesus in their medicine cabinet or in their closet and just pull him out whenever things are difficult, whenever they need it. He makes a good crutch to lean on. Except that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, but will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And people are offended that Jesus would leave anyone out in a trap. Well, all these traps cause us to be offended by who Jesus really is and that offense leaves us trapped in death. But the Lord doesn't want us trapped in death. The Lord didn't want John and his disciples trapped in death. That's why, that's why Jesus explains to them who he really was and why he came. And he truly is the one who was to come. And he said, here's who the one who was to come was to be. And he told them about the prophecy of Isaiah from Isaiah chapter 61. And he said, look what's going on around you. Now go and tell John what you see and hear. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. The deaf hear. The lepers are cleansed. The dead are raised. And the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who's not offended by me, Jesus said. The Lord doesn't want us to be caught in that trap of being offended by Jesus, but instead he wants us to be caught by life. And what's interesting that here in Luke chapter 7, verse 23, when the Lord says, blessed is one who's not offended by me, he uses that word that has to do with being caught in the trap of death. But then in Luke chapter 5, a couple chapters before this, when he called his first disciples and sent them out, you remember this, they were fishermen, they were out by the sea, and he called them and he sent them out, and he said, no longer are you going to fish for fish, instead, from now on, you will catch people. Luke chapter 5, verse 10. And when he said that, the word he used for catch was also a word picture, because it was a compound word, using the word for catch and the word for life, you're going to catch people alive. And that's really what the message of Jesus does. It catches us alive. No longer are we caught in the trap of death, but we're caught in life. And this is not an intellectual thing. It's not something that we think about and decide to act upon. It's not like you could have come to the children's program here at 10 o'clock today and watched the children act out the Christmas story and then got home thinking, hmm, what do I think about that story? That sounds like a pretty neat story. But is that true? Is that not true? Am I going to believe that or not? Let me think about this. No, that's not the way... God presents it to us. The way that God presents this is that we hear the message of Jesus and we're caught by it because the work of the Spirit in our heart begins to create faith and we believe that He is the one who is to come and we're caught by life. And we need to be caught by life because Jesus is the one who is to come. And one day he is going to come with swift and severe judgment. He's going to make distinction between what is good and what is evil. But before he could come and do that, he came on his first advent. And he had to come first in mercy in order to pull us out of death's trap. And he pulled us out of death's trap by taking our place in it. And he was caught in death's trap as many were offended by him. And as he died in that trap, the Father opened it up and set him free in a resurrection. You see, and this is why the scandal of particularity, this is why there is no other way to the Father except through Jesus, because it's only through his death and his resurrection that we too can be set free from that trap of death. And see, this is why Jesus cannot be universally tolerant and affirming of everyone's life choices. Because it's only those who recognize that our choices have led to sin who will find freedom from the trap of death that Jesus is offering. And this is why Jesus will not be put into our medicine cabinets or into our cupboards, only to be taken out when we need him. Because Jesus is the, the source and the sustainer of life. He's not to be leaned on as anyone's crutch. 
to bust it up. We're not offended by him. Blessed are those who are caught by Christmas. I pray this year, as the Christmas season goes on, you're caught again by that message of Christmas. Because there's nine nights before Christmas, and all through the house, hopefully not a creature is stirring in yours, not even a mouse. So your stockings hung by the chimney with care in hopes that Jesus soon will be here. If so, then may you do what our children did today in the Sunday School Children's Program, what Jesus told his John's disciples to do in this text. Because there are many in this community who are flirting with that trigger on the trap of death. So go. Go and tell them what you have seen and heard. In Jesus' name.